Okay, here we are at the 11 o'clock block on Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. Uh, this is Think Tech Tech Talks, because we're going to talk about tech today. And uh, we have Randy Minas. He's on the faculty of the Scheidler College of Business. But better yet, even better than that, he's into, he's into information technology. Welcome to the show, Randy. Hi. Thanks for having me, Jay. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm so interested in this. Uh, this is why I love my job, such as it is. <laughs> So first, first of all, uh, your specialty is information technology, and that is so important. It's important for business, but it's also important for hmm, everybody about everything, because we, we are living immersed in a world of information technology, and we've got to get to learn it. Right. And so I guess, you know, there's two sides to that question, um, if you could speak about it. You know, one side is the technical side. How do we make this happen? How do we make it work? The second side is, how does it affect us? Um, how, how should we deal with it as a, say, a consumer of information technology? Am I right? Do you break it down that way? Yeah, yeah. I think that that's a, that's a good way to, to break it down. There's one, how do we use the technology? And the other side of it is, is how do we use it responsibly? How do we, mm -hmm. how do we use it in a way that, that betters um, our interactions with each other? And, and how do we use it and not use it in a way that kind of is detrimental to the, to the interactions with, with each other? So. And you have you have uh, you have uh, degrees in what information technology in business in both? Yeah, my PhD is in information systems with a uh, with a minor in neuroimaging, and uh, I got I have an MBA, and then my undergraduate degree is in neuroscience. So, um, so my neuroscience, research, yeah, well, neuroscience. that really adds a special dimension. It's interesting, yeah. So my research focuses on connecting uh, neuroscience with IT. What? How does how does the information that we process today um, and the technology that we use today affect our processing of information? And, and does it does it have good effects, bad effects, and that and that kind of kind of? I stuff. find so that fascinating. fascinating. Yeah, we have a lab at UH that looks at that. Has it ever occurred to you that the neuroscience of the brain is just a computer anyway? It is. Yeah, I, it is. <laughs> it's like a computer with a heck of a lot of connections, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. At the end of the day, we're all mammals and can can never forget. <laughs> right, right. And so we created a uh, system that is <laughs> that you know the IT systems reflect um, how our brain actually operates. So let's talk about the program. Uh, you guys have devised a program in Scheidler. Really uh, fabulous to have this at the university. Uh, it's a master's of science program. Can you talk about it? Yeah, uh, so we have been working for a few years on developing the Master's of Science and in Information Systems, or MSIS, program at, at Scheidler. And this is a 30-credit hour program. It's a very common degree on the mainland. It's actually one of the best ma master's degrees that you can get on the mainland. Um, we're bringing it out here to Scheidler, and we're really excited to start it. It starts fall 2020. Um, we've extended the application deadline because of the COVID-19 situation. Lots of things happened in the spring. Um, so the, the degree is focused on, uh, on getting the technical aspects of, of information technology as, and pairing it also with the managerial aspects of it as any, uh, like an undergraduate MIS management information systems degree would do. This is taking it up a notch to the uh, more technical and managerial aspects of it. So who would be interested in this or who is it tailored for and who does it want to attract? <laughs> actually an interesting question, but it was originally designed um, as a bachelor and accelerated master's degree, and that's just academic terms for uh, uh, what we call a four plus one program. So uh, for our undergraduates that are getting MIS degrees, um, they can double count three courses that they take their senior, senior year as, um, as for the master's program. So it reduces it to a 21 credit hour program for them. But then um, when we were talking with industries and, and CIOs and um, everybody out there, they were like, there's a, there's a huge market demand in industry for this as well. So there's the full-time program, which is, um, which is alongside that too. So initially it was designed for the undergraduate that was getting an MIS degree to stay on an extra year and, and get that extra level of learning so that they could enter the job market. Um, that much more competitive, but now it's also, um, there's been a huge demand also from the, the industry wanting to come back in and get the degree as well. Oh, I would imagine, I would imagine because it's a, it's a, it's a wave of the future. It, seem, it seems that every day it becomes more important, especially uh, with the advent of all the social media, other communication programs. I mean, I, mean, I, I get these uh, <clears throat> newsletters and it seems like every day there's somebody inventing some other kind of communication system 
that will rule your life or at least enable yeah. you to do all kinds of things you couldn't do yesterday. Yeah, uh, exactly. And, and you know, I was actually teaching a digital transformation course in the spring um, to MBA students when we had to go through a huge di digital transformation from a meeting in class to meeting online. And um, we all in various ways were thrust into that. Uh, and that was that was an interesting process to go through. And so I think a lot of us can relate to that right now. And um, how we manage that process is really important uh, to understand. And, and that's what our master's degree, you know, kind of we have a we have strategy of how to how to manage that transformation as part of the curriculum. Yeah, and it sounds like it borders on the whole communication field. And like, you know, think tech, we do videos, but we also do data processing. Um, and, you know, we have lots of technologies that support our video mission. And right. I suppose it's all connected. And so you, it's not, you can't be alone on information technology. You gotta be in, you know, able to touch those other fields and help them or use them. So when, when right. I'm in, go ahead, go ahead. Well, I mean, I, when I, I haven't used this analogy for a really long time, but when I was in the PhD program, I would always argue that it's, it's almost like psych, studying psychology. Psychology affects every single aspect of other of other uh, areas that we study, IT has become a similar way where IT affects every single field that we're in as well, and every single industry in the in the business environment. I remember, uh, you know, this is fifteen or twenty years ago at UH. Um, a lot of the departments, uh, a lot of the mm, researchers, uh, PhD, uh, were were devising their own programming. <clears throat> they were going beyond the spreadsheet. Uh, they had lots of data they had to manipulate and analyze, and, and they were doing it themselves. And I would say to them, uh, why don't you go to the computer science department? Why don't you go to you know, some central, highly expert group? Do that. And they said, no, uh, we just do it in our own department, and we, we do it just as we need it, no further than that. And I'm saying that's not really efficient. You have to have, you have, to have experts who can reach out to other disciplines and help other disciplines. Which side of the fence would you be on on that issue? Well, I think interdisciplinary work is is critical. Um, the lab that I that I have at UH is uh, with uh, the information and computer science department as well. So it's the two of us collaborating, and so we bring in um, you know the the highly technical side, and when we pair that up with the, with the more of the, the business or, or social science side of it as well. So if I go into this program, God, it's mm -hmm. very tantalizing. Um, do I program? Do I actually code? Or do I learn about all the you know various programs that are coming down the pike and being established either commercially or by open source? Um, uh, how how deep is the is the dive? Yeah, that's yeah. So the the aspect of the the technical side of it, um, one of the really important things that a lot of our uh, undergraduates end up going into, and I would imagine you know at a, at a higher level, the MSIS students would be. Uh, like a data analytics or a data scientist or eventually managing uh, a team like that. So for that, uh, you need to know how to manipulate data. You need to know how to work with big data sets. Um, but in terms of like the programming or highly, highly technical aspects of it, uh, you'll be exposed to it, but and, and you'll understand it. But the majority of it is how do we manage it? How do we put um, how do we put this into the organization in an efficient and, and effective manner? And how do I know enough about it to manage a team that is going to be working on this, this very project? Um, so, so that's kind of where we're geared. It's kind of like if you have you know, the completely managerial side of it and the completely technical side of it, how do we pitch right down the middle on it yeah, and yeah, say, yeah. okay, we give you enough technical, we give you enough managerial, and you can, you can be that manager. I have to do both. It's, it's about business management at the end. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So um, what, what kind of classes? Can you identify some of the subjects that are in, in the classes offered in the program? Yeah, yeah. So we uh, we have some um, classes that will focus on like data analytics and business intelligence and, and abstracting up um, from data to information to creating knowledge uh, for the organization that's valuable. Um, we have advanced cybersecurity course uh, that that gives you more cybersecurity training. Uh, so that's that's another aspect that's a really hot area right now. And uh, then data management um, and enterprise data management, as well as just data management, data government governance in general, um, enterprise resource systems, those types of things. Uh, so those are those are the, those are kind of the core courses that we focused um, on initially. And then we also have um, 
digital transformation, uh, which is uh, more of a strategy oriented course on how to take a business that is trying to implement a new business process or something uh, that, that needs to be digitized. Uh, and so that's that's getting back to the systems analysis and design uh, type work. This, you know, it's true. A couple of thoughts on that is mm -hmm. uh, so many times you see that uh, somebody comes in and we, oh, we're going to we're going to upgrade our system. We're going to digitize our system. We're going to put it in a database somewhere. And uh, people think, well, OK, at, at the end of the day, I'll be able to find things easier. <clears throat> it's much more than that, because yeah. in order in order to make the analysis to create the database, um, you have to you have to examine your whole business and you wind up reorganizing your whole business and coming out to a whole new level. You thought it was just a matter of record keeping wrong. It's a matter yeah. of re-examining, re re reimagining your whole business operation, isn't it? Yeah, or sometimes just like you're thinking just of subtracting out one system, putting another system in its place. And 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 really, if you if you look at the capabilities of the new system, you can really reimagine how it's going to affect uh, your organization. And, and so that, yeah, that course in particular tries to pair like, Okay, what's our strategy of the firm with what's our IT strategy of the firm, and make sure those two things align before you just start to haphazardly implementing technology that you think is cool. Yeah, the other reaction I have is that is that um, you know out out there in the business community, even now, uh, even with the advent of uh, Zoom, um, there there are people who are self admitted, slightly contrite luddites. Um, they seem to be everywhere, and they and they are at all levels of management. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting, you know. You well, I, I would say that a person who has reached high levels of management probably has a better understanding. Um, but there are a lot of people who have reached relatively high levels of management that have no understanding. Okay, so when you say that you're going to offer this program as, as a separate separate offering um, to people out there in the field and business, I think is extremely valuable because it will raise all boats and it will do away with many Luddites that we have today. Um, it will give them management skills uh, that can leverage their whole company. And we need to reimagine a lot of companies now in COVID. Um, we have to get them back into the marketplace, but much more efficient than they were. So this is, this is you know, much more than it seems to be. I don't think this program is limited in any way to Manoa. I mean, to the market in Manoa, the, yeah, the yeah. academic market. Yeah. I, I absolutely agree, and I mean it's, it's serendipitous, right? Um, in, in a bad way, I guess maybe uh, <laughs> that you know that the the pandemic situation is happening. But it, it, right when we launched the program, and, and you know, there's a lot of like you know worrying about contraction in, in UH budgets and everything. Um, but this is one of the programs that really would help make sense of what is going on with the industry and how we manage all of the changes that we're going to have happen. And the other thing that I'll just say for, for people that are watching that, that are considering the program is that when I went back to get my MBA, it was during the 2008 recession. Um, so also during recessions, it's a good time to go and back, go back and get a master's degree and improve your, improve your education on, um, on any variety of fronts. Sure, or watch ThinkTech and learn so much. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> so <laughs> when does it start and how does it start and how are you dealing with COVID in organizing, you know, the material, the classes, the interaction with the students. Right, right. So the uh, the fall 2020, right now we're still following UH guidelines as, as we have to, um, and we're planning to be in person in the in the fall. Um, it, one of the things about the program that I, that I didn't mention at the beginning was that it, it is geared towards um, allowing you to have a full-time job or a part-time job. So the classes are taught at night from six to nine o'clock at night. So um, you can have that full-time job. Right now we're, have it, we're hoping that they're going to be in-person classes in the fall. If they turn out to be online, we'll be ready for that ad adaptation as well. Um, but uh, right now we're going forward with the plan of, of being um, in-person for for the fall semester, yeah. Mm, great, great. So, uh, if I am watching and I'm and I want to know more about this, uh, where do I go? I get a website. Uh, yeah. So um, I can I can send you guys the the website information. Um, if you go to the Scheidler uh, .hawaii.edu, there's a uh, MS in Information Systems uh, link there. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about the program, um, I'm also uh, willing to meet with students. Uh, it's msis at hawaii.edu. Well, thank you. Um, for and that. We'll make sure you get we get you that information. 
Um, and so the, the applications we're doing, um, rolling applications probably uh, through uh, at least the beginning of July. And there's a $100 application fee. Um, and the, oh, and the tuition is uh, 887 per credit hour, just so. So what, what's the prerequisite? Anything? Uh, prerequisite, we'd be looking for uh, business, um, business experience and, and some technical experience. Uh, it doesn't have to be uh, exactly like you've taken, you know, you have a deep understanding of networking or, or whatever, but working with, in a business with IT um, people, so people that are coming back in a managerial, in more of a managerial role. Um, having worked with the IT department, that might, that will be enough for you to, to start. Um, you know, if, if you're undergraduates in, in English and you've kind of been working, uh, you know, in, in hospitality jobs or something like that, uh, we might want you to take a, a course or two to get the, the technical prerequisites that you need um, and the managerial prerequisites you might need to get to, to, get to the level of, of the master's program. So you'll help me tailor it to my own situation and uh, my own expectations, I guess. Yeah, I mean, we're in Hawaii, we're in a, a community where we want to try to help as much as, as possible and help each of the students kind of uh, achieve what they want to achieve um, while keeping, you know, standards and everything in place as well. You know, one thought, uh, and we've heard this many times in the last few weeks, is uh, that, that people don't want to return to a mono economy with, with the hotels. Uh, mm -hmm. They want to have a more diversified economy. Now, we've been having this conversation since statehood. Um, and it never really got traction. Look at us now, we have a mono economy. But, you know, they, when they talk about reinvention, they talk about technology. They talk about getting back to, the, you know, the dream of the mm, 80s, 90s, uh, to have a technology sector that really makes money. Um, and it seems to me that what you're offering does feed into that. Uh, because a, an executive, an entrepreneur that has this kind of managerial view of technology is, is more likely to be able to succeed at an entrepreneurial uh, attempt, um, you know, using the skills in this program. Yeah, I think absolutely for, for small and mid-sized businesses, this is, this is critical information to, to help give your business a leg up, especially if, you know, uh, heaven forbid we have to go back to uh, the social distancing and isolation, you know, having that e-commerce side of um, your business in, in, in some way, shape or form and having the ability to get that up and running or promoted. Um, that's that's important. But just in general, having a, a small business person with a knowledge of, uh, how to promote your business through technical means is just as just as important as the brick and mortar store. Sure, and, and likely to become more important. But yeah. let's flip. Let's flip to the, the thing you and I were discussing before the show, which okay. I, I enjoyed our conversation so much. And this is the ordinary schmo, you know, who's out there in a world of, of uh, digital media and uh, you know high high speed communication all around him, where he is drawn to it because he feels that or she uh, feels that he he has to watch out for every email, every message, because any one of them uh, could bite him. And so he's walking around in a state of anxiety all day, um, you know, chasing the information that's in there that directly affects him. Uh, and thus he, he gets married to it and mm -hmm. he gets dependent on it. And maybe he's unable, um, you know, in a biochemical way, a psychological way, unable to properly process this. So he accepts things that are not true. Uh, can we talk about that for a minute? Because I think that's the, the mammalian flaw in the ointment, uh, that here we have this high science and then we have, we're emotional, we're biochemical individuals. Um, can we handle it yet? And I think that's what you've been studying and thinking about for a long time. Yeah, yeah. So with the, with the work that I've done in um, cognition and, and kind of marrying that to how we respond to IT systems, uh, there's the, Daniel Kahneman, a, a very prominent uh, economist, uh, has, has written a book called Thinking Fast and Slow. And it's about how the mind works and, and it, it works in two different ways. There's what we call system one thinking, which is really, really fast automatic thinking. So, you know, things that you 
do that you don't even think about like um you know when you're when you're driving to work you're not thinking about everything that you're doing to you know in the car necessarily unless that your attention has to be focused on it because there's some danger in front of you and then there's system two cognition which is the deliberative cognitive thought the, the cognition that we're using to have this conversation essentially um so a lot of like the ways that we process information online is the system one like automatic responses i believe that i don't believe that um i think about this in a certain way so i'm just gonna and, and you can we just move on we just scroll through that instagram feed we scroll through that facebook feed and we have these instant kind of reactions to them um, without thinking deeply or stopping to to deliberately think about it and so uh what you know it's it, it's called confirmation bias where we believe what we want to believe and or we believe what we believe in the past and what has shown us to be true in the past and we see something that contradicts it we tend to divert back to what we already believe um, and so, uh, and so that's uh, that creates this this bubble of information that you that you are doing um, that we all do that we've done since the you know the, when we were worried about tigers attacking us right which is what we were talking about before. Um, now you have algorithmic al algorithmic bubbles that are put on top of that that we're not even sure you know unless you're really tech savvy of what they're doing. So you, I call it the bubble times two in Facebook, right? So they're giving you what they want you to see. And then you are seeing and interpreting that through your own information bias lens as well. And that's so that's like the bubble times two. And so those are doubly insulated bubbles. And what it does is it really makes us start to drift off of uh, what the ground truth is. And, uh, and that happens in, in a variety of different ways. And so when you become so insulated, it's really hard to pierce that bubble. Um, so you have to really be conscious about getting outside of any one uh, social network or, or anything, seeking out information from other sources. And that's and that's exhausting sometimes because you know it's, yeah, who's got time to do that? Um, I'd rather just scroll through my news feed or my or my Facebook feed and uh, and just react to it. Um, but but it's it's vitally important that we're seeing in, in society. Well, you know, it, it it floods up a whole bunch of. Uh thoughts in my mind. I, um, you know, I, I wrote for the paper a long time and, uh, and I, I could never control my headline. Never. There were people hired in the newspaper, in every newspaper. They write the headlines. Right. And that's like what you're talking about with the feed. When you go through the feed really quickly now, you're reading the headlines. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, in, unless it really touches you, you're not likely to click into it. You don't have the time. Yeah. Uh, so you, you, you gain this kind of superficial layer of information. And the guy who writes the headlines has enormous influence on you. The headline can be twisted this way, that way, anyway. Um, and so, you know, you have disinformation is, is so easy and it, it's, it's so it's, it's uh, ubiquitous. Um, now, in the case of the, the newspaper with the headline, you can have two guys sitting on a, on a porch with rocking chairs. Uh, and one guy is reading the paper, he sees the headlines, and he, he reposts it to his friend, and his friend says, that's poppycock, that's not true. So you get, right, you get a, a kind of a, a control mechanism just in the human interaction and a little time and space to think about it. Uh, uh -huh. when, you're, when you're there with your phone flipping through all the stuff, you don't have that. And there's nobody saying it's poppycock. You have to make the poppycock decision yourself. Right, and you gotta you gotta be disciplined about about saying that is that is Bobby Gack or that's not. Um, and yeah, and what we were talking about before was that the you know, the the flags or flagging information as true and false. There was a lot of hope that that would that would help. So Facebook initiated a, a fake news flag essentially that was that that only existed for like six or nine months, and we had done a research study on it that showed that. If you believed the information that was presented to you and there was a fake news flag associated with it, it made you one angry and two, it made you just discount the flag completely and, and move on. Um, how, da so it, how dare they argue? Yeah, how, da <laughs> <laughs> how dare they um, try to challenge me? It's not your friend that's gonna like come over and be like, you, you gotta get in you know, your right mind again. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. um, you, you agree with Zuckerberg's decision uh, not to flag anything? um i well i mean in the political situation or just in general the political in the political situation i think that there's much more responsible actions he could be taking on it um the the flagging the information that that twitter is doing while it is serving a a some purpose i'm glad they're trying to do something it's not likely to it's likely to result in the same 
the same thing that we found in our study that people that believe uh, the tweet are going to believe it and say, okay, Twitter, I'm mad at you for putting that there. And people that didn't believe it were like, oh, I'm glad that Twitter put that there. I don't believe the tweet anyway, and it's not going to move anybody from the discourse. Um, but getting that information, allowing that information to come out there and kind of percolate through society is what the real danger and problem is. And so as much as we can create interrupts on some of that where we stop and think, I mean, that's a, the, the poppycock thing that you were talking about, your friend, you know, saying you're, you're reading something that's, that's clearly not true. Um, we, did a, we did a study, we're working on getting it published right now, but um, we looked at if we had people rate the credibility of the news source, almost like a Yelp rating while they were going through their Facebook feed, um, and it just had them stop and consider whether they knew it was true or whether they had personal knowledge of the situation and the credibility of the news source, that created them to think more deeply and be more critically, um, more critically approach the information. You know, Randy, I've been thinking about that for years. I think you're totally <laughs> correct on that. I think I was going to ask you in you know the remaining time, what is the solution here? Because yeah. it comes at you faster, you're more suggestible. It mm -hmm. happens more quickly to more people. It can re redirect and um, you know have a negative effect on huge, multi-million populations in instants and in seconds. So yeah. how do you control that? And I think I think what you just you know described may be a real solution. We gotta we gotta save ourselves from this. <laughs> it's not healthy. There's got to be a solution, and it's got to come from the people who understand what happens in information technology. So the rating system would mm -hmm. be very influential on me. If I saw that this source was you know a negative source, I would take that different. Mm -hmm. uh, even if I even if I otherwise like the the, the, the you know the the media. Um, yeah. So I, I hope this can happen. How how can it happen on a large scale? Uh, I mean, we've got to get uh, policymakers somehow involved, or we have to get the organizations themselves, Facebook, Twitter, the social media giants, to be willing to make some sort of strides in that in that area. And I don't think all of them, all, all the social media giants, are unwilling to step into the area. I just think that they've gone a little bit into it and and see and have seen some things that haven't worked and so they're kind of more reticent now to try to put other things into place even though right now is when we critically need some of that um in place well you know this could come out of your program it could come out of the Scheibler school it could be a system of ratings where you have multiple sources of ratings on a given author or publication. Mm -hmm. It's like, like eBay, you know, I'm, I'm surprised that Piero Media hasn't done this for eBay, uh, well, for Civil Beat, which is a, you know, it's one of his companies, so, mm -hmm. uh, or although it's a nonprofit, he's, he started it. And, and the idea would be is that the, the, the reader writes the rater, the reader writes the right, rates the writer, um, mm -hmm. the, uh, all kinds of media, all kinds of data, interpretations go in there and at the end of the day you have a metric and the metric is very influential on, on how you take this uh, this uh, particular yeah. piece and, of and information. The, the the other part that's really really key is just getting the person that's doing the rating to stop and think for a second too so if you're you know going through facebook and they say you know could you please rate this this headline that you just are, are scrolling past if that gets the person out of this automatic accept and just kind of um, let the information come in, then that's going to create some difference too. And these little changes add up to, to, to big changes in our behavior um, in the long run. Yeah, there's no reason why something like this couldn't be done, I think. And it would have a, uh, I think it would catch and it would be very valuable. And yeah. so your program is very valuable. Your whole area of examination on this. I really appreciate it. I appreciate you coming on the show. I hope we can get to talk again soon, Randy. And I wish you well on the program and on dealing with COVID and developing the program. Yeah, well, well, thank you very much. And thank you for the opportunity to come on here and, and, and chat about the program and, and the other stuff. I, I love doing it. Um, and I hope we can get to talk more too. So um, uh, I'll send some information, uh, a program information packet that you guys can put on yeah. online or something. Thank you, Randy. Randy, All right. thank you very Shiloh much. School of Business. Thank you so much. Aloha.